The subject for this evening's talk is, is the Bible homophobic and sexist? So the subject is, is the Bible homophobic and sexist? The very short answer to that is no, but unfortunately some Christians are sexist and homophobic, but the Bible itself isn't. But that doesn't mean that the Bible agrees with our culture in every point. So what we're going to do this evening, I'll first of all explain why I don't believe the Bible is homophobic or sexist, and then we will just briefly at the end look at what we should do, how we should respond to the Bible if it challenges our culture and some of the things that our society says are right and wrong. And I'll start off by looking at the issue of sexism. And I can only do this briefly, obviously the big issues. But if you were to look at the history of the human race, by and large, women have been oppressed and downtrodden by men throughout the whole of history. Even in our own country, if you went back a hundred years, women could not vote. There were many careers that were closed to women, and they were generally regarded as the inferior sex. And even now, a lot has changed since that time. What you'll find is that if you look at the top companies, most of the managers in the top level will still be men. If you look at how many women are in Parliament compared to men, the vast majority of MPs still men. So even now, our society is not as equal as many people have become to believe it is. And some people will view the Bible as a product of this male-dominated, patriarchal world that we live in. God is portrayed as male in the Bible, and quite often you have accounts of men who clearly treat their wives like property, and have multiple wives, including King Solomon, who had 700 wives. He clearly did not believe women were his equal if he thought he could have 700 wives. And so, a lot of people look at the Bible and say, well, that's part of the problem. The Bible is sexist. I don't believe it is. And what we'll do, first of all, is to go back to the very beginning and look at the first few chapters of Genesis. Now tonight I don't want to get hung up on can we take Genesis literally because next month we have a talk on science and the Bible and we'll be able to explore those issues in more depth then. But what I want to do is look at some of the theological truths that we're told in Genesis. And the first one is in Genesis chapter 1. In verse 27 and 28 it says this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now those, those two verses tell us really important things about the Bible's view of men, women, and God. First of all, it tells us that men and women were created equal because it says they were both created in the image of God. Now the thing that the Bible says that sets human beings apart from the animal kingdom is that we were created in the image of God. That's the thing that makes us distinctive and unique. And both men and women were equally created in that image. It means they have a fundamental equality in God's sight. It also tells us something interesting about God because it says God is more than male. Even though he is described in the Bible as a father, it says that male and female were created in his image, which implies that in God's character and being you will find masculine traits, but also feminine traits. And so when we consider the fatherhood of God, we need to take that into consideration. And if you read the Bible closely, you'll find passages like the Song of Moses, which talks about God as the rock who fathered you, which is a very strong masculine image. But the very same song talks about God who gave you birth, which is a feminine image of God's nature. Elsewhere in the Bible, God is recorded as saying that as a mother comforts her child, 
so I will comfort you. Which again is a very feminine aspect of God's character. So what we find is that the Bible, although God reveals himself as a father, that does not mean that he's not telling us that God is male. Because God is neither male or female in the way we are. God contains both elements, both characters. So the Bible does not portray a male God in the way that many people think it does. Though if we read on a little bit further in Genesis, we get to Genesis chapter 3, which talks about the fall. And this is the point where human beings chose to reject God and to live independently of Him. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, one of the consequences of the fall this. Talking to the woman, it says, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now that phrase, he shall rule over you, is the start of men dominating and downtrading women. And so what we clearly see there is that it was not part of God's original intention or design for this world for men to downtrade women look upon them as inferior. That's something that came into the world when we chose to reject God and to rebel against Him. So when we read on in the Bible to people like Solomon who had 700 wives clearly didn't reveal being women as equal, we need to consider that in the light of what Genesis 3 is telling us. Because that tells us that what Solomon did was wrong. And if you actually read the Bible, every example of a polygamous marriage where a man has more than one wife, what you'll find is that the Bible is subtly critical of it. It will show you that it causes problems and it leads to dysfunctional families. And the Bible is saying, this is not the way God wants us to live. And when we come on board to Jesus and his life, we see even more that God does not approve of the way men have treated women throughout history. Jesus lived in a culture that took very negative view of women. Jews at the time, Jewish men on a daily basis would pray a prayer, but part of it would say, I'm thanking God that you did not make me a woman. They would also not talk to a woman in public, and Jewish rabbis would not have thought that it was a waste of time to teach a woman the Torah, the Old Testament law. Because it was squandered at someone who couldn't understand it. Was it you? That's the kind of culture that Jesus lived in. But when you read the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus spoke to women in public. He allowed women to become his disciples and he taught them alongside the men quite happily. And we also, we also find that when Jesus rose from the grave, the first person he chose to appear to was a woman. Even though in Jewish culture they wouldn't let a woman appear as a witness in court because women's testimony was regarded as unreliable, Jesus chose to appear to a woman to make her the first witness of what he'd done. He broke the culture and tradition of his day because it was not God's standard. That was not how God wanted men to treat women. So what we find if you read the Bible carefully, far from being sexist, it actually proclaims it quite men and women and criticizes male culture, male dominated cultures that suppress women's rights. Now, that's not a whole picture on the Bible's view of um, men and women, because what the Bible does do though, it affirms the equality of men and women but it says they have complementary roles. And any idea that says that there is no difference between men and women is not what the Bible says will lead to a happy society. A happy society is one that values men and women as equally, but also values the distinctive differences and honours those differences between them. And perhaps the point where that gets the most controversial will be on the issue of headship which means someone who takes responsibility, who shows leadership. And I'm going to read you two passages from the New Testament. The first is in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, verse 3. And this is where it says, But I want you to understand 
that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. So it says the head of every man is Christ. And the head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Then a bit later on in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, it tells us that wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands love their wives, but Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands love their wives, but Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now some of you, by now you think that's not my idea of equality, to be told that as a woman I have to submit to my husband. But I would encourage you to think about this from the Bible's viewpoint, not from some of our assumptions that we have in our modern culture. There's a relative in my family, I won't say who it is, but back in the late 1950s, early 1960s, she was a very talented artist. She started getting contracts to do illustrations and she started to earn quite a reasonable salary. But her husband did not like the fact that his wife was more successful than him or that she was earning more money than him. So he stopped her working. Now when the Bible talks about wives submitting to their husbands, that is not the kind of marriage that it has in mind. So what does it mean? What is it saying to us? So the first thing you need to realise is, it's only talking about a husband-wife relationship. It's not saying that women must be submissive to men. Secondly, the model of that relationship is Jesus. And we're told in 1 Corinthians that Jesus is the head of the church, but also the Father, God the Father, is the head of Jesus. Now the Bible teaches that Jesus is fully God and equal to his Father in every way. So the fact that the Father is his head does not mean that he is less equal or inferior to his Father in any way. It's a voluntary act of submission and a willingness to serve, which actually is a strength of character, not a weakness. So headship within marriage does not imply that wives are inferior to their husbands or any less equal to their husbands. It's a voluntary request. And you also finally need to consider the Bible's view of leadership. Jesus was once talking to his disciples and he said to them, when you look around the world, you'll see leaders who regard themselves to be as superior and better than the people they lead, and they are served by the people under them. But if you want to be a leader in my community, you must not consider yourself better, and in fact you must serve the people that you lead. So it's a completely upside down view of leadership. So where it says in Ephesians that husbands should love their wives, as Christ loved the church. What the command there is, that a husband should see himself as a servant whose role is to put his wife's needs and desires before his own and to serve and encourage her to be able to reach her full potential as a human being. That is a far cry from a husband who stops his wife working because her success threatens his masculinity. So when the Bible is talks about the role of male headship, it's actually asking you to submit to someone who is to use his authority and leadership role to do his very best for you, not to serve himself. And in fact, if you read the Bible, nowhere does it say that women cannot work. Nowhere does it say that women should do the lion's share of housework. Nowhere does it say that men cannot get involved in child rearing because it's a woman's job. All those traditional attitudes have come to us through our culture, they've not come from the Bible. The Bible affirms the essential equality of men and women, and it says they have complementary roles, which is why I do not believe the Bible is sexist. So if the Bible is not sexist, is it homophobic? Now Peter Tatchell, who is a British campaign for gay rights, Allegedly once wrote on his website that the Bible is to gaze what Mein Kampf is to Jews. The Bible is to gaze what Mein Kampf 
is to Jews. And Mein Kampf was a book written by Adolf Hitler. So it shows you his impression of the Bible and how he would feel about the question is the Bible homophobic? Now, I want to argue tonight that his impression of the Bible is wrong. Firstly, homophobia is the fear or hatred of someone who is either homosexual or a lesbian. And so, an example of homophobic behavior would be if two people met, they start a friendship, they initially get on very well, and then one of them puts up the courage to share with their friend that they're gay, then their friend shuns them and wants nothing more to do with them, despite previously getting on like a house on there. That would be an example of a homophobic response. It's treating people differently, purely because of their sexuality. If someone faithfully and consistently follows the Bible's teaching, it should be impossible for them to adopt or behave in a homophobic attitude. You only have to look at what the Bible teaches. It tells us that hatred is wrong. It tells us that we should not adopt a judgmental attitude that looks down on other people and considers them to be worse than us. On the more positive side, it tells us we should love everyone, including our own enemies. And we're also told that we should do everything we can to live peacefully with those people around us. So if someone faithfully followed all those instructions, it would be impossible for them to behave in a homophobic way. And when Christians do behave in homophobic ways, it's because they are faithfully following the teaching of the Bible. So firstly, I'd say the Bible is not homophobic, because if you follow its teaching and you live the pattern of life it sets for us, you will not be a homophobic person. But the term homophobic has become quite abused, especially in the media, because for some people it's come to a stage where either you must agree that there is nothing morally wrong with same-sex relationships, or you are homophobic. There's no concept that you can disapprove of someone's lifestyle and life choices without lapsing into hatred of that person. Well, actually, it's completely possible to do that. You know, I don't smoke, and I don't really approve of smoking. I think that it's a bad thing to do, and it's a wrong life choice. But I don't hate smokers. And I don't treat them any differently to people who don't smoke. I just think smoking is wrong. And that's quite an important distinction, because while the Bible forbids homophobic behavior, it does contain some passages that appear to be critical of same-sex relationships. And the reason I say it here is because, if I'm going to be honest with you tonight, some Christians take varying positions on this matter. So about a week ago, I was listening to Radio 4, in a program called Any Answers, which is like a discussion program, and they were discussing the topic of gay marriage. And a man phoned in, and he said that he was uh, a lapsed late preacher in the Reformed Church, he made the rather confident opinion that he knew the Bible better than most. And he said that from what he could see from the Bible, there was nothing in it that should cause anyone to disagree with gay marriage. And his argument was that Jesus doesn't discuss the issue of homosexuality. And it only gets mentioned in one or two obscure passages in Leviticus in the Old Testament. And we ignore other stuff in Leviticus, so why can't we just ignore what it says about homosexuality? Well, that's certainly a viewpoint. What are we to make of that? I think, actually, he made a mistake. There are actually six passages in the Bible that clearly talk about same-sex relationships. Two of them are in the Old Testament, but the other four are actually in the New Testament. So it's not just a case of one or two obscure verses in the Old Testament. When we look at those verses, they give a consistent message that says that same for two people of the same sex to engage in sexual action is not is wrong and is not what God would want us to do. And so I'll give you an example of the one that the person on the radio program referred to, and that's in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. It says this. It says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You should not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Now that clearly is expressing a viewpoint that uh, same-sex action, between, so a sexual act between people of the same gender, is wrong. That's what the Bible is saying. 
But I need to point out a few issues. Firstly, it's only talking about behaviour. The Bible never comments on orientation. It only comments on people's behaviour. And that's because your sexual orientation is a morally neutral thing. If you took a heterosexual person, there is nothing inherently sinful about being attracted to people of the opposite sex. But you can choose to express that attraction in a way that is healthy and wholesome, or you can choose to express it in a way that is unhealthy and would lead to emotional and spiritual damage. It's not your orientation that matters, it's what you choose to do with it. And that means that if an individual experiences same-sex attraction, there is nothing inherently sinful about having that feeling. It is not sinful to be homosexual or lesbian in your orientation. What the Bible talks about is if you choose to act upon that and engage in sexual activity. The second thing I need to talk about is the word abomination. Because it did say in that verse that if a man has sex with a man, it's an abomination. And the word abomination means something that is detestable. And that does sum up the Bible is particularly picking on same-sex relationships as somehow being really terrible. But actually that is not what the Bible does. In Proverbs chapter 6, we, we have a list of Proverbs around about verse 16 where it says there are seven things that are an abomination in the eyes of God. Seven things that are detestable to God. And then it lists seven things. None of them are sexual. Same-sex relationships are not mentioned in that list at all. But two of the things that are, one is pride and the other is telling lies. Now I would, would, if I was a betting man, I'd actually bet there's not a single person in this room tonight who has not told a lie at some point in their life. Which means every single one of us has committed an action that is an abomination in God's sight. Does, but God, does God hate us all? No. The most famous verse in the Bible is John 3, verse 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. God loves the world, it means he loves everyone in it, despite the fact that all of us have done things to offend him. And the message is that anyone who is willing to come to Jesus in faith and to ask for forgiveness for the things they've done wrong will be forgiven and welcomed into the community of believers. So Jesus loves gay people just as much as straight people. He came to save gay people just as much as straight people. And they are as welcome to come to in faith as anyone else. The Bible does not single out homosexuality as being a really terrible sin and much, much worse than what anyone else does. It actually says all of us have done things wrong that have offended God and all of us need to repent. And that is really important because actually the sad reality is a lot of churches see that like homosexuality as a really terrible thing and make people who have same-sex orientation relationships feel like somehow they're beyond the head. And that is completely beyond the heart and purpose of God to do that. You know, I've seen photos of Christians and they always seem to be in America, but I don't think they excuse the America. Waving placards with offensive slogans on them. Offensive things that say stuff like gays will burn in hell. And when they do that, they're just being hypocrites. Because I've never seen anyone waving a placard that says people who tell lies will burn in hell. Or people who steal stationery from work will burn in hell. So why do they pick up that one sin to particularly protest against it? They're just being judgmental and not following the teaching of Jesus when they do that. And actually, the church and Christians have done an awful lot of damage to uh, gay and lesbian people over the history, over a period of time. Damage that was actually not something God was going to do, and is an expression of their own prejudices. Because if someone was to follow the teaching of Jesus, they would not treat a gay or lesbian person any differently to a straight person. So some people might argue then, well, what is so bad if you have a couple in a long-term committed relationship
relationship, living together faithfully, could happen to be of the same sex? What possible problem could God have with that? And I think actually the answer to that question is found for us again right at the start of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, we read this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And then we read in verse... Um, and then it goes on to say, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought it to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now again, I don't want to get into the can we really expect people to believe that in this modern day age, because we'll do that next month. I just want to look at the truth that that is telling us. Because what it says is that it's not good for a man to be alone, that as human beings we were made for relationships, all sorts of relationships, but one of them we were made for was to have a loving, committed sexual relationship. And that's part of what it means to be human, to find that relationship. And in Genesis, in that passage, it talks about a search to find a suitable companion for the man. And what is provided was the woman. And she's called his helper. She is his complement, the one suited for him. And that he is to express that relationship in a lifelong, monogamous, committed relationship with this woman. Now the key point there is that the complement for a human being, the person who is designed to fulfill them, is a member of the opposite sex. And the reason why that's important is because men and women are fundamentally quite different. We think differently, we respond to situations differently. And that means that a man cannot bring to a relationship everything a woman can bring to a relationship. And a woman cannot bring to a relationship everything that a man can bring to a relationship. And because we were designed to be complemented by someone of the opposite sex, it means that if someone is in a same-sex relationship, they cannot bring that same complement, that same fulfilment to the relationship as someone of the opposite sex group. So if someone is in a same-sex relationship, what it says is that they have settled for less than God's best for them. And because God loves us, He wants us to have what is best. Which is why God has said the proper expression for human love and human sexuality is within a marriage relationship between a man and a woman in a lifelong commitment. It's not done to be mean, it's done because that is what is best for us. So I would say to you tonight, the Bible is neither homophobic or sexist, but it clearly does contradict the values of our society for around us. So what should we do with that? Should we now say, well, we have more cultured, we're more developed, and when the Bible is written, we've outgrown it, we should just ignore the bits that we don't like, because we now know better. Now, if that's the view you want to take, then I'd encourage you, before you dismiss the Bible, to think about your cultural prejudices. Your cultural prejudices. Because although, if when I read that passage from Leviticus about same-sex relationships, you might think, well, that's unacceptable. How can anyone believe that in this one-day age? If we were to travel to the Middle East and read the same verse to someone on the street, they would say, well yes, that's right, I agree with that. Now you have to ask yourself, what makes you think our culture is better than theirs? The reason why we assume it is, is because this is the culture we grew up in. The things we believe seem natural and sensible to us. But then in the Middle East, that is the culture that they grew up in. The things they believe also seem natural and sensible to them. And it actually is arrogance to assume that we have got it all right and that they have got it wrong. And it is simply arrogant to assume that if the Bible challenges our culture, then we are right and in a superior position and the Bible is wrong. I would actually encourage you to read the Bible and as you do so you may discover that its values and standards begin to make more sense to you 
and the values and standards I get from the world around me. Also, what we need to consider, as well as that, is that if the Bible didn't challenge us, then that would actually be something to treat it uh, with suspicion. Because the Bible claims to be able to tell us how we can have a relationship with the living God. Now, any relationship you have it challenges you. Because we have to change, we have to adopt this new person. And there are going to be things about us that are going to irritate them, but we have to try to change and try not to do as much if we want that relationship to work well. And so if God is real, and we are to have an authentic relationship with Him, we've got to expect to make some changes in our life. And so the very fact that the Bible does challenge us should give us more confidence that actually behind it is a real God, a real person, communicating with us and inviting us into a relationship with Him. A relationship to which we are all welcome, but a relationship that will require all of us to make some changes to our lives. And finally, you must decide, does God hate us or does He love us? Because if God loves us, then He has reasons for saying the things that He has said. And that if we follow them in relationship with Him, then while initially they may seem daunting and not what we want to accept, I think we will find that they lead us into a fulfilled and happy life through this relationship that brings into the God. Now that's all I'm going to say in my talk, but it comes now to uh, time for questions. So if you have a question, just put your hand up and uh, just remember what we said earlier about being respectful to the people around you may have different views to yourself. <laughs>
Does anyone else have a question? Um, Richard, is, in your opinion, would it, is it possible that someone who believes their orientation is that they're gay <clears throat> to to reorientate themselves to, to, to heterosexuality? Okay. Or, or is it that they just have to make that choice from a Christian perspective to, to be a celibate right. person? Okay. <clears throat> uh, the question was, uh, basically, is it possible for someone who feels that they have an orientation to same-sex attraction to reorientate themselves, if you like, to become heterosexual orientation? Or is it just a case that they have to be celibate for life? Um, there are organisations, uh, one of them is called Exodus International, that claim that they're able to work with people, same-sex orientation, and some of the people they work with go on to get married to the opposite sex and appear to live a very happy and fulfilled life. I think that their own figures, and I don't know if they're exaggerated at all, would be about 50% of the people they attempt to help. Uh, and that's quite low, but it's actually Alcoholics Anonymous has a 30% success rate, so it shouldn't necessarily write it off. I'd probably say from my own experience, I've met three Christians who uh, had an uh, orientation of same-sex attraction before they became Christians. One of them feels that they no longer do, and that they now have a heterosexual orientation. The other two have remained attracted to people of the same sex. So I think there's no, no guarantee that someone will change. And there should never be any expectation put on someone that if they became a Christian, now you've got to change your sexual orientation and get married because it doesn't work that way. It seems to work for some people, but not for us. Trevor. Is it possible for animals to be homosexual? Um, people who study animals have seen some signs of same-sex sexual behaviour amongst animals. Uh, and so and some people actually don't use this as justification by saying, look, we see it in the animal kingdom, so why should we not see it in human beings? That the weakness of that argument is we see a lot of other things in the animal kingdom that we do not want to see human beings. So male hippos will try and kill any male babies born, and a female prey mantis will murder her partner after they've um, mated. And we don't ever look at the animal kingdom and say, therefore it's okay for women to kill their husbands once they've got children out them. So you have to be quite careful about drawing parallels in the animal kingdom because we're all seeing different times. But there are some signs that some do seem to have the same sex. Isn't that a hypothetical situation? You have a gay couple come to church and they've been in a very long standing, committed relationship. They then become Christians. Would you encourage them to part, divorce, um, split up? Um, well, that's quite a challenging question. The question is if. Uh, a gay couple who been a very long standing relationship came to church, became Christians, would I then be telling them that they had to separate? I mean, that obviously is a huge, huge question. I think what I would tell them is that if they wanted to faithfully be a disciple of Jesus, they need to be celibate. That doesn't mean that they have to break off their contact with each other or even stop living together if they thought they could live together and maintain a celibate stance. Um, but it's a very difficult area and you have to work with people over a long period of time and I'm not sure if I would, well, I'm not sure what I would do, we'd have to see the situation, but the, really what the Bible would seem to indicate is they need to become celibate but wouldn't necessarily have to break off their association with each other if they can maintain their celibacy. Would be what I would say to them. Does that answer your question? Yes. Sometimes you know, some adopt children and all sorts of situations. It is, yeah. Bob. Say, say, on my time, you had a um, comedian who um, turned out to be gay, um, but his jokes were sort of clean and maybe not related to that. Would you laugh along with him? Okay. Uh, the question is, if I went on a night out and uh, there was a comedian who happened to be gay, but his jokes were sort of clean and 
and stuff. Would I laugh along with him? Yeah. Yeah, why not? The fact that he's gay wouldn't affect his ability to make funny jokes, so I hope that I would laugh along with him. Any more questions? It's a verse in the New Testament that says it's a disgrace. Yes. Okay. It's a verse in the New Testament that thinks in 1 Corinthians that it, well, I think it says women should remain silent in church rather than it's a disgrace that women speak in church. And I was asked if I could comment on that. Um, first of all, you have to look at the teaching of the whole New Testament because at another place it says that women can pray and prophesy in church. So when it tells on the one hand for women to be silent, it doesn't clearly doesn't mean they must not utter a word inside a church building. And what how most people interpret that verse is this, because what it says is for the context, it says that women should, women, women should remain silent in church and they if they've got a question for their husband, they should wait till they get home and ask him when they get home. And it's written to a church in the Greek city of Corinth. And in those very early days, the church would organise itself along the same lines as a Jewish synagogue where the men sat in one part of the room and women sat in another or sometimes either or even on a balcony separated from the men. So if a woman was to ask her husband a question in church she would literally stand up and shout across the room to ask a question. And so that would be a very disruptive thing to the church service. So what most people would say is it's actually referring to that particular kind of scenario where it said where we're talking about women being quiet as in don't shout out and disrupt the service. You've got a question, wait to get home and ask your husband. Don't do it in the middle of the church service. And also, I had a friend who actually, uh, one of my lecturers at Bible College, was a woman who once visited a Jewish synagogue. And the women were sat behind the screen and the men were in the hall where the main action was taking place. And the women spent the whole time talking to each other and occasionally they'd get shushed by some of the men. And, uh, and when she experienced that, she said, I can fully understand why Paul wrote women to be quiet in church, if that's what they were doing, it was very disruptive and annoying. <laughs> and even her trying to take part in the service, it's disruptive to her. So I don't think it's a prohibition for women taking part in church services. I think it was a particular situation in that church that it was being written to. That answers your question. Mark. Um. Was your point in raising the um, the issue of, um, in terms of sinning, that you know that homosexuality is just one of many sins that, so that in God's so from God's perspective, there's no hierarchy of sin. One sin, you know, we all sin, but there are various um, <coughs> possibilities. Of, um, and, and are they all equal, or are they? Is there a distinction? Um, the, the question is, <coughs> does God have a hierarchy of sins? Are some things worse than others, or are all sins basically equal in God's sight? Uh, I think the verse in Proverbs shows us that the idea of sin, some sins being an abomination to God, is not just restricted to same-sex behaviour. There are actually many things. And actually God is quite different to us. He's holy and the things that the Bible calls sin that we do wrong are offensive to God. And I think God is equally offended by someone who tells lies as he is by someone who steals, by someone who commits murder as he is by someone in a same-sex relationship. I don't think God rates sins in the way that we do. Because it does say in the book of James that if you broke one law in all of God's laws, it's as if you broke all of them. You know, you're just as bad as someone who broke all the others broken one law because God's standard is perfection. And so I, I don't think we see a rate of sin in the Bible. What's your view on whether women should become vicars and clergy? Okay. The question is what is my view on whether women should become vicars and clergy and stuff? Now, I did talk about male headship in terms of a husband having a leadership role in a marriage and in a family. And because of the space of time, I didn't talk about how that then plays into the church. And I think the reality is in the Bible, it does talk about the overall spiritual leadership of the church is a role given to men. 
and where that works itself in our churches, we're a group of three churches, and all the churches are led by a group of elders who are men. But then each individual church has its own its local leadership team that runs it day to day, and that's made up of men and women. And women also take a very active part in the life of the church. And the only role that they're excluded from is becoming elders. Um, and that's the way you can do it because we believe that the Bible does teach that in the church there should be ultimately male headship. And under that male authority, women can pursue many varied ministries. When that comes to church leading and this and stuff, I don't quite know how it works in church leading. If that means that that kind of top tier is the bishops, then that would be fine to have women vicars, we wouldn't have a problem at all. If it meant that top tier is the Archbishop of Canterbury, then potentially it could be fine to have women bishops as well. I don't know quite how the church even works, but Christians differ on it, but if I'm being honest with you, I do believe the Bible teaches that overall spiritual authority in the church is a male role, and however that functions in the church can determine whether or not women can be the uh, some of this tapping in the watch indicates that the time is going on. So, uh, if there's no more questions, we'll call you into an end there. If there's anything you want to ask me, or you didn't want to ask in front of everyone, then just come and grab me and I'll be really happy to talk to you. So, thank you all for listening. And next month, on the 18th of April, we'll be looking at the subject has, Does Science Contradict the Bible? And we have some flyers here which you can pick up to remind you on your way out and also there are some free booklets on the stand at the top stairs which everyone can have themselves to as well on their way out so thank you for listening.